So first of all, thank you for joining us, everybody. Um, how's your KubeCon been so far? Yeah. Excellent. So quick show of hands. How many of you have been at the uh, Platform Engineering or Observability Talks this week? It's a pretty good number. How many of you have gone to the Security Talks this week? Also a pretty good number. I'm, I'm impressed. So if you've been to any of those three types of talks, you came to the right place. So our talk today is about uh, containers. It's good, uh, from standards to practice, the journey to container maturity. Um, quick intro to who we are. Off on the right, I'm Tom Robinson. I've been with Yelp for 12 years. Gosh, it's been a long time. <laughs> um, mostly working, working on uh, backend services um, and working on keeping Yelp secure. Before that, I did AV. In my free time, I make video games. Carmen? Hi, I'm Carmen. I've been at Yelp for about two years and started working on this project with Tom a year ago. And yeah, happy to be here. Happy to be here as well. All right. So our talk today is split into four sections. Um, the problem, the journey, the model, and the takeaways. Um, there should be ample time to uh, have Q&A at the end. Uh, my time this is about 25, 30 minutes. Um, so just keep your questions for the end, and we'll, and we'll be able to answer this. We'll also be in the hall afterwards. So problem. So for most of the time this week, you've probably been thinking, been thinking about your application at scale. We've been talking about Kubernetes instrumentation platform. We've been talking about your security solutions sort of at the macro level. Um, but here we're here to talk about containers. Why containers specifically? Because you might think of that as kind of the smaller component. Well, the answer is, if you're thinking about this from the perspective of an attacker, they usually start inside of the container. Um, so let's say they, they pwn a box or pwn a little one of your containers running in a pod. Um, first thing they're going to do is you know, look at Etsy shadow, look at the process space, and be like, OK, we see this application running. What does it mean? And then they're going to start to breed the configuration. They're going to try to sort of gain leverage. And they'll, they'll come be in there and saying, saying, oh, wait, there's data in here. What happens if they see your container connected to three different S3 buckets? And all those are just you know, set to read, and they have your crown jewels. Well, that's bad. Um, so that, that person is basically going to get, you know, take their hoodie, go like this. I don't have one, but you get the idea. And be like, hey, 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 S3 data, it's mine now. And you know, some time later, you're going to discover that they're going to send you a nice, nice little email saying, hey, we got your data. We're going to try to, ex we're going to try to, you know, get money out of you in order to get to, so we don't publish it, or it's going to show up on the dark web. You don't want to be in that position. So container security matters. Um, containers are part of your attack surface. And even though you're thinking about your application at scale, you also have to think about the microcomponent and what that means at scale. So at Yelp, we have uh, thousands of deployed containers. Um, we also have, we have these deployed across dozens of um, environments within the company. Um, I'd give you an exact number, but the lawyers would get me. I'd be pulled off stage, so let's not do that. But um, in terms of servicing those containers, um, we tend to rely on alerting. Um, alerting is very limited. It doesn't necessarily give a good prioritization model. Um, it tends to be very to cre create alert fatigue and cause people to not be able to basically service it at the same way. So if someone will receive an alert, they'll go to a run book. Um, this means that you have human error crop up as part of that process. Um, so instead of trying to do that, we try to um, sort of improve this over time, as we'll see in later slides. Um, we also had difficulties with visibility. Um, this means that. Uh, we had just a couple audit logs. Um, we have some visibility that we have inside of our environment. We, for the most part, for the KNS containers themselves, we didn't really have much to look at. And so we had to, to so starting from what was effectively zero um, within our Kubernetes deployment, um, we started to sort of develop that intuition, develop that from the container level going forward, and then develop that, and then sort of bake that into our instrumentation platform. So what we wanted here was to be able to determine what is the environment with the most vulnerable containers? What, what, what are those containers within that space? And sort of start to build intuition of how to improve that. Um, we want to improve our security and posture both in those environments. We also want to improve it across the board. Um, this means that um, if we're talking about this from the perspective of an attack surface, we're trying to sort of reduce the available vectors that an attacker has within, and leverage that they have within our environment. This means that we are thinking about this from the perspective of sort of um, when the tides rise, it lifts all boats, so to speak. Um, we're basically trying to improve our security posture across the entire container space and basically understand what that means. 
So what we decided to do was create a container maturity model. Um, you've probably heard of uh, maturity models at this conference already. CNCF are, has its own maturity model you can also look at. Um, in this particular case, you want to create a tiered model measuring the robustness of container images, um, basically both in, in terms of their static and deployed characteristics, as well as what the configuration that they happen to deploy happens to be. Um, we developed a roadmap to reach an acceptable level of uh, container security, basically focusing on using that level across different subdimensions, which we'll touch on. Um, to sort of improve the characteristics of, across the entire space and sort of improve and sort of define key characteristics and KPIs that we'd be able to focus on. Um, we tried to make sure we could enforce and track progress over time. Um, so basically, instead of this just being one point in time, we basically have this continuous function for each of the individual characteristics. And we want to align this with industry best practices, both in terms of the open source space and within some of the you know, print vendor space. I'm sure you've seen some, plenty of the solutions um, showcase detailing this. And the goal was to quantify these improvements over time, develop the intuition around that, and be able to develop a model around it. So this might be the first talk here at, like I haven't seen any at who they were talking about vulnerability management, but just to, to, call it, to sort of draw a distinction between what a VM program is and what container maturity means. Um, the VM space, you're mostly focusing on a patch don't patch characteristic. Let's say you have an incoming CVE that has a series of characteristics that you then decide whether to patch or don't patch the vulnerable software. It um, also focuses on prioritization and triage. So what are the most important CVEs? What are the most important risks and characteristics that you're trying to define within mostly this, like the installed software, the actual dependencies, what's happening on the Linux hosts that are happening within the containers, and all the deployed characteristics. And you're also mostly focusing in that case on risk management. Basically, what are the most risky packages? What are the most, uh, what, what is the input vector? And for the most part, when a novel CV comes in, the hair on fire of, oh my gosh, we have to patch this, what do we do, right? Um, container maturity, it's a question of deploy, not deploy. So one can think of this in the concept of CICD, of whether um, you launch or don't launch that particular pod or that particular container. Um, so this operational signal, this also focuses on operational signals from the container space specifically. So how is that pod operating? What anomalies exist? What does anomalies mean? And what are the characteristics of the containers outside of just the application? And finally, um, this also informs um, basically different sort of cross sections that we'll look at later. Um, so this informs both the individual containers. So what does that mean in terms of the risk of the container itself? Uh, what it looks like within a particular deployed environment, and what that means to the control plan itself. Like, let's say you have an insecurity that all containers show that are happen that's happening in Kubernetes, like the Kubernetes instrumentation platform itself. This also helps you understand that and take action. So, at this point, I'm going to hand this over to Carmen to describe our journey of getting there. Okay, so yeah, I'll go over a bit about our journey and how we designed the model. So, one of the first things we looked at was existing industry standards uh, were already out there, such as Red Hat, CIS, and NIST. And we did this so that we could build on reputable sources instead of reinventing the wheel ourselves. Um, however, there were some challenges because we couldn't exactly copy and paste these guidelines into our model because some standards were either difficult to enforce or they weren't applicable to us. So for example, CIS Docker Benchmarks recommends that we only install the necessary amount of packages into our containers. But when you have the, uh, as many containers as we do, each that have a few different requirements, it's hard to know what is a definition of standard for all of these containers. So for us, we had to think about what we can enforce at the top level and versus what we leave up to the service owner's judgments. And other challenges we ran into was that there were not a lot of examples on how to prioritize remediating non-compliant containers and also how to enforce these guidelines at scale. And we also had some trouble finding detailed examples of what other companies are doing to implement these guidelines in their companies. So um, there was some ambiguity for us in what the model looks like. So in order to start reducing this ambiguity, we um, decided we needed to clearly define the scope of our model. So for example, at Yelp, there's a bit of overlap between what is owned by the security team versus what's owned by the infra teams. And we decided early on that our model would only be concerned with the contents and the configurations 
of the container rather than the infrastructure running the container. And that is because the infra teams already have a lot of good tooling covering um, the management of the infra, so there's no need for us to duplicate th these efforts on our end. And setting this boundary early on allows us to determine what should or shouldn't be in our model going forward. And so the next thing we did was to start filtering out any standards that were not relevant to us or we were modified or added standards based on our processes and also based on the scope that we just defined for our model. And so for example, at Yelp, we have this tool called Yokio Drift that automatically updates service dependencies. But in order for it to do that, um, repos need to be set up to integrate with this tool. So we added a standard to our model saying that um, repos should have this integration set up with Yokio Drift. So our goal with this is so that we can have a formal list of container security standards that are tailored to Yelp. And this became the first component of our model. So now that we have this checklist, so if a container is failing a bunch of these items, how do we know what to fix first and what can wait? And one of the ways we can start thinking about that is by thinking about risk. So for example, some containers are naturally riskier than others because either of the permissions they need or because of the things that they need access to. So for us, we identified some high-level container risk factors such as the level of access to the container, the sensitivity of the data that is processed by the container, and also the impact if the container was to be exploited. Um, and the last part um, also depends on what security standards that a container is not compliant with. And so because different security standards also have different levels of impact, we decided to represent this by assigning weights of low, medium, or high to each of them based on their relative impact to the container's confidentiality, availability, and integrity. And so um, to define these terms, confidentiality means that the, to, to ensure that access to the container or its data remains protected, Availability means to ensure that the container or its data re remains accessible or functional. And integrity means that the correct container or data should be served. And so this level, this, this method of categorization is actually based on the NIST risk management framework. So the higher the weight, the higher the impact on container risk. And our goal with all of this is to not only show a list of what security issues a container has, but also provide some signals for what to patch first. And so with that, the second component of our model is risk management. And so now that we have this checklist, we have a way to prioritize these items by risk. So now it's time to think about how we can enforce this model at scale. And like Tom mentioned, we have thousands of containers at Yelp, so automation is gonna be key here. Um, and luckily, we already have a few tools that we already use, such as OPA Gatekeeper, and some, we have a, some other internal audit logs that we also use that can do the heavy lifting for us. And so all we have to do is to write some scripts to process the output from these tools and map it back to the standards in our model so that we can create metrics and dashboards. And so the third component of our model is automated compliance checks. So I mentioned that we want our model to be able to generate metrics, and that is so that we can have an indicator of the model's impact on container security. And so we came up with a few ways to quantify the concepts that I discussed earlier. So first, um, each standard is graded as a weighted pass-fail score, and this would represent whether or not a container is compliant with each given standard in the model. The second, and for, the, for each container, we want to assess the access level and data sensitivity so that, and score, assign a score to these based on a rubric that we created. And both of these types of scores make up the container impact score. And so the higher the score, the more likely a container will be exploited and the consequences of exploitation would be more severe. And the final metric is the container maturity level. And this would be derived from the impact scores of all the containers within a given deploy environment. And it basically represents the container security posture for each environment. 
And altogether, these metrics would give us not only the ability to track whether or not container maturity has changed over time, but also by how much. And so now the second last component of our model is a container scoring mechanism. Um, and so now it's time to think about what it means to use this model in practice. And in order to do that, um, we need to think about who our users are. And that's because in order for a model to be successful, people need to be willing to use it. So we identified two groups of users. The first is other developers. And that's because we have a bunch of containers that each work a little differently. So it's best if we rely on the teams that own these containers to fix their own security issues. And the second group of users is leadership or management because they rely on the data that our model generates to make both roadmap and business decisions. And we actually shared a detailed plan of our model early on with a portion of these users so that we can get their feedback and make improvements. And with all of our users, the goal is to make the model as intuitive as possible so that people don't have to read too many docs to figure out what's going on. Because if a tool is too frustrating or complicated to use, people will just not use them. And so our strategy with this is to incorporate the model into the software development lifecycle as much as possible by leveraging tools that are already part of the developer's workflow so that there's less of a learning curve. So for example, we want to add pre-commit hooks and linters to catch certain security issues early so that developers can get immediate feedback and fix certain issues right away. And it also saves time for whoever will eventually review that PR. And then when the container is ready to be deployed, we would like to add abilities to block the deploy deployment in our pipelines so that developers can fix any remaining security issues before the, their containers go to prod. And we want to also have continuous monitoring with dashboards and alerts. And so that, and the data from this can be usable by anyone from our team, other developers, and also management. And for all of our tools, we want to make sure to include clear remediation instructions in the output so that developers will know how to resolve their issues. And finally, to make sure we don't roll out a bunch of disruptive changes to the entire org all at once, we want to have a plan to gradually roll out our model. So now I hand it back to Tom to talk about the final design of the model. Thank you, Carmen. So just to recap the five tenets of our model here, we wanted to have a curated list of, of container security standards. We wanted to integrate risk management practices. We wanted automated compliance checks throughout the entire system. We also wanted to have a container scoring mechanism. We also wanted to have, and we also want compliance checks to be integrated into the entire software development lifecycle. So for the next slide, I promised myself that I would color this and make it actually look more applicable to uh, our slide deck before submitting it to KubeCon. I promised ah. that I would make it look a little better. <laughs> so in any case, um, <laughs> here's the model that we have. And just to kind of recap here, um, the way we implement this is we have a series of checks that are in scope. Um, so one can think of this as um, anonymous user running inside of the container, um, whether that container is respecting resource checks in terms of CPU, uh, memory, and disk, uh, whether it is has special capabilities. So for example, if it's mapped to the host, container, the host process space or the host IP space, um, whether it is running in certain modes, et cetera. And basically, we turn each one of those checks into a pass-fail um, and then weight that pass-fail by how, we, how risky we consider that to be to our organization. Now, this is going to be different for your org. We'll get to that later. Um, but the goal here was to basically um, sort of map out the set of characteristics that we cared about, um, ensure that we were able to identify the ones that are of, mo of most risk, and then sort of provide a maximizing function so we could have those bubble up through different layers, different subdimensions, different environments that we have. So one can think of the maturity as kind of the inverse score of um, what the highest risk is. Um, and the goal here is 
because this bubble is going to propagate through the entire environment, it means you can have basically an indicator light or um, sort of a prioritization function to define what the most risky containers are. Um, so with that all said, here are the use cases for it. Um, I promise the rest of the deck is a bit more finished. <laughs> um, so this means that we can provide deployment checks for containers first. Um, again, in the context of CICD, this means that if any of those characteristics are failing, um, we can basically either prevent those containers from launching or basically nuke them from orbit. Um, it's the only way to be sure. Um, in order to <laughs> um, ensure that non-compliant containers are not running inside of our um, uh, Kubernetes cluster and it's inside of our service instrumentation platform. Um, this also means that you can basically take this to define risk um, and use that to define overall risk assessment, both in the container space and as a component of your overall risk management strategy. Um, this also helps you meet compliance objectives. So GDPR, SOX, PCI, I'm sure you've heard about sev from several talks about all of this, if you haven't already um, handled it as part of your organization. Um, this means that you basically have um, a series of checks available and a series of indicators of how compliant you are. And when it comes audit time, you can basically um, provide that data and not have to really stress out about it. Um, this also means that you can have this as complementary to patch management. So if several containers are all showing the same risk or showing that they have some set of requirements, usually it's an indicator of, a, of an issue at the lower level. And occasionally it means that the software packages that you have installed are requiring that risk. Um, and so you can provide this as a complementary signal to VM. Again, this is not a VM program itself. This is not defined to be such but you can provide that as a signal to that particular platform. And then finally, um, this provides dashboarding and leadership objectives. Um, so I don't have a big uh, showy diagram as part of this, um, but we do have a few internally. Um, and the idea here would be to be able to visualize um, sort of the most risky uh, containers that happen within the space and be able to provide that single pane of glass that people know and love, because everyone loves a good visualization, right? Um, Everyone loves a good pew-pew board as well, but you, you get the idea. Takeaways. And I regret to inform you that this is all food from here on out, so if anyone missed lunch, I'm sorry. <laughs> Our lessons learned here um, are, first of all, you need to prioritize security and engineering resources. Again, you can't just provide a whole bunch of alerts and run book them, um, because you're going to have a whole bunch of human error. You're going to have a whole lot of fatigue. Um, and so you need to, to basically be able to figure out and map out what is most valuable within the space and what is most valuable overall. Um, it's also valuable to push for metric collection, even when it's hard. Again, all those observability talks that a number of you have been to have pointed that collecting metrics is hard. But just because it's hard doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. In fact, quite the reverse. Exposing certain data to, sun, to sunshine, especially the stuff that is most meaningful for your organizations, matters. Um, and then abstraction is a useful tool. Again, we're talking about containers here, but use the abstractions that Kubernetes and other capabilities provide. Because thinking about pods, thinking about your instrumentation plane, thinking about all the tools that Kubernetes provides are themselves useful to understanding what your risk is and understanding what your risk management strategy should be. Finally, how do we apply this? Um, so again, Complementary to VM to vulnerability risk management. I won't reca recapture that, but you get the idea. Um, this also helps you define key concepts w within your, your model. So basically, finding and identifying the most um, applicable, most useful, and most risky components of your container, um, and basically applying that across each of the environments as we described before. Um, this also gets into our use cases are going to be different than yours. Um, this is a little strange because. Um, there are plenty of vendors here that are going to come up and say, yeah, we can meet all of your needs. Um, in this particular case, we can't. And in this particular case, your organization is going to have to think about what your organizational risk is, what your data is, what your containers require, and then use this model in order to define those risks and characteristics. So the goal here isn't to just give you a one-size-fits-all solution. The goal is to give you a way of thinking about this. And I think that's pretty valuable. That's why we're here. Um, it's also, um, also uh, you should automate whenever possible. Um, again, um, go going back to the runbook solutions here, 
That, gets, that eliminates human error. It means that everything is applied more consistently. And it means that you can scale that capability instead of trying to basically throw more people at it. Um, it's also important to understand, again, the most critical um, needs and capabilities of the organization, as I touched on before. And remember that the model must constantly evolve. So I've been around the space for a long time. 15 years ago, we were talking about just the idea of, of a virtual machine and what that meant. Um, 10 years ago, we were talking about MapReduce and Hadoop. Remember all of that? Um, a couple of years ago, we started talking about, about Docker, and now we're talking about Kubernetes. I don't know what the future holds. If I did that, I wouldn't be here. I'd be investing in stocks. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, what I do know is that security best practices will constantly evolve, and that as the space evolves over time, as more abstractions are provided, as new tools are developed, security will develop alongside of them. With that all said, thank you for coming. Now, our, our shot clock here says we have nine minutes left for Q&A, and I know the question you're about to ask, so I can actually provide that if that's okay with you. Because you already came up and asked me. Okay, well, let's go with your answer, and then I ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, so my question is, how do you find the information such as the production criticality impact of a container, and how and where do you store that information so it's usable to compute the score afterwards? That is a great question. That is, ironically, not, not the question you asked initially. I love that. <laughs> um, so the answer is, um, first of all, in terms of aggregating and collecting it, um, we had been using, so I, I described the tools uh, to you previously, but um, we basically started with um, looking at Falco, uh, KubeBench, KubeHunter, and um, Popeye in terms of the tooling layer. And then for the actual communication layer, we were actually using a combination of our own into, internal Kafka layer um, for, for message delivery. Um, we actually have a series of other capabilities that are baked into Pasta, Yelp slash Pasta, that's our uh, service stack. Um, and then we would basically we would have an aggregation layer inside of Splunk as well, which is a tool that we use internally. Um, so yeah, Splunk's huge. You probably know exactly what it is. Um, and so basically, we defined a pipeline that delivered all these messages um, through that layer into Splunk, and then use that as our aggregation point and our searching point, um, as well as our earlier um, cases for defining the model, defining what each of the scores meant, and just kind of playing around with the data. Um, as for um, what that means to, let's say, alerting and actionability. Um, we have a layer built on top of that that allows us to provide alerts, provide triage, and soon we're, we're basically working on the capabilities for basically what that prioritization model will look like over time. So does that help answer, answer your question? Perfect. All right. No problem. Hi. First off, great talk. Thanks Thank so you. much. Um, my question is about the kinds of misbehavior that we've been able to catch with this program. So what is the naughtiest thing you found containers doing in prod? <laughs> oh, would you like the honest answer to that? The answer is developer, so. what developers do to it, first and <laughs> foremost. <laughs> because the most difficult challenge is meeting the business needs while keeping your application secure. Um, and so there's always, as you've already always heard with security, there's always this tension between developing product and developing it securely. We, have, we like to think we have a pretty good working relationship between security and Yelp. Um, and so um, in terms of uh, misbehavior, um, typically it's mostly misconfigurations to start. Um, but we have seen cases in which folks have pivoted and tried to go after data. Um, thankfully, those are limited. We caught them. But um, the most, not necessarily egregious, but most difficult case we have um, is how do you detect what happens when someone goes from that container and pivots, um, both within the environment that's deployed, both within the service layer, and within the data that the container has capabilities and access to. And that's what mostly keeps us up at night, but I think we do a pretty good job of it. Awesome. Thank you both, Thomas and Carmen. Thank you. Oh, you oh, okay. I um, can flip a coin. 
A lot of times with situations like this, the technology is the easy part and driving human change interacting with people is the harder part. So I'm wondering what were your, your lessons learned or some of the challenges that you were able to overcome when interacting with people and actually putting this in front of them and helping to drive their change? Great question. The answer is start small and start with your lead users early. Ask questions um, and ensure that you're talking to the right stakeholders early. Um, because if you're just spinning in a vacuum, it's not, you're not going to be able to deploy this, right? Um, so engage the, the users you have, engage um, their managers, their, like the C-suite, everyone that you can, and ask hard questions, and then start small. Thank you. Um, and then scale it from there. It's the lesson I'd have. Yeah. Was, was this very well received when you rolled it out? Or yes. did it take some negotiating? Um, it, was well, it was very well received, though there is still that tension, yes. Thank you. Great thank you. Thank you. Hey, um, first of all, thank you for, for the talk. Uh, my question, I hope it's a very short question. So do you have any way to measure the level of success of this model that doesn't involve the model itself? Like, because you're, you're giving a metric, right? Mm -hmm. So you can say, yeah, look, the metric has improved, but do you have any other way, like a parallel way to measure the level of success of this model? That is a very good question. So the answer is we can measure it against the status quo first. So we can measure it against what alerting and capabilities we've seen both in the past and currently, and basically A-B test it. Um, and then the other capability we have over time is to, as we develop that intuition, define individual, um, I wouldn't call them functional tests, but basically tests of the model. Um, so the idea here would be, um, I'm not sure how much you, you have you, you ha experience you have with model training and what that looks like, but this would basically fall back to statistical cross verification, uh, cross validation, excuse me, um, and other characteristics to ensure that those that those ha that the the model is um, doing the right thing. Um, this would mean defining experiments, which is something we do internally all the time, um, and this would mean defining um, what that success criteria looks like. Um, over time, not necessarily just what we have today. Okay. Yeah, that, that's something that <laughs> I could get some help from my DSML team. Let's talk after this. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Uh, also, uh, great talk as well. Um, Thank you. And then, so I was curious, you mentioned a bunch of it sounded like runtime uh, scanning tools. Yep. Uh, do you guys do anything uh, at the build time to uh, generate these metrics? Yes. Um, I guess first question. Yeah. Okay. Um, feel free to give your second one, but um, um, the short answer is yes, we do. Um, so we, we, ha we basically have it bundled with unit tests for the application first. Um, second, we have a series of characteristics that are baked into uh, the service instrumentation platform. So that's Pasta, which is actually sitting on top of Kubernetes. Um, and they actually have a series of structural test checks and an actual contract for us to be. Um, and so that is kind of the second release barrier. And then the third is just basic software checks. Um, so um, this would mean that if any dependencies are known to be insecure, we kick it out of the build pipeline. Okay. Continue. Yeah. And then the second one is, I guess, sort of related uh, to the question earlier about like where do you store the scores. Uh, this one is like it seems like some of the scores either you guys are using heuristics or from the scanning tools itself. It also sounded like there needed to be some sort of manual like we're going to evaluate impact of this container because you know it sits here or it sits in that environment and maybe it sounded like there's at least a little bit of manual component. Is that the case? So. The manual component is the knobs for what um, the Yelp risk score happens to be. Okay. Um, and that is defining what, how important and how impactful those characteristics are. Over time, just as a uh, gentleman over here had asked, um, we're able to develop that as, as a series of experiments and provide tension against that manual process. But the initial score setting is done by us, yes. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you so much for spending, spending time with, with us today.